Hi guys, Savannah here. I just wanted to come on before the video started and let you guys know that we did have some technical difficulties this week. My camera has just not been working. It's been acting up for months. And this week, I think it finally crashed so this week there is going to be a little bit of a different setup with the video we were able to get the last half of the video version however the first half of the video is going to be strictly audio but we're still going to show you pictures of the case and things like that but if you are wondering why everything is looking so different this week that is why however by next week everything will be back to normal but just wanted to let you know that we were having some technical difficulties this week and to just bear with us and with that being said let's get on into today's episode episode. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started into today's case, I do want to say make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly every Wednesday on the podcast and every Thursday on YouTube and you're not going to want to miss it. As you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the upsetting and disturbing murder of Cassie Jo Stodart. Now, this case is one that you guys have recommended ever since I started, Killer Instinct, and you may be familiar with it as it is oftentimes referred to as the Scream murders for reasons we will get into in a little bit. But with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Cassie Jo Stodart was born on December 21st, 1989. And at the time of her death, she was a 16-year-old girl living in Pocatello, Idaho. Now, Cassie lived in Pocatello with her family, and she was known by everyone around her as very responsible. She put her academics first and was a straight-A student. She also had a boyfriend at the time named Matt Beckham, who we will get into in a little bit as well. Now, Cassie attended Pocatello High School, and she was a junior at the time of her murder. Now, even though Cassie was very academically driven, she definitely prioritized school and her grades. She also was a pretty social person as well. She had her boyfriend, Matt, as I previously mentioned, as well as a good group of friends. And no one had a bad word to say about Cassie. Cassie really kept in her own lane. She was worried about her school and she had her boyfriend and that was kind of it. She was never the type of person to start any drama. She was never the person to get involved in anyone's drama. She really knew herself and was grounded and who she was and wasn't worried about the high school drama that comes along with being a 16-year-old girl. She just wasn't interested in it. Cassie was always the person that everyone could count on. That is what everyone said about her. She was super reliable, again, super responsible. And her being so reliable and responsible is exactly what led her to be house-sitting for her aunt and her uncle at the time of her murder. Cassie's aunt Allison and uncle Frank had asked Cassie to come over and house-sit for them in their home that was located on a Whispering Cliffs Drive of Northeast Bannock County, Idaho. Now, this was only a couple miles away from where Cassie lived, and she felt really comfortable doing so. Her aunt and uncle only needed her to stay there for the weekend to watch out for their dogs. They had three cats and two dogs that obviously couldn't be left alone, and Cassie was up for the task. She said that she would do it, no questions asked, and she was also kind of excited to have the house to herself for the weekend. It really gave her the opportunity to be able to have some quality time with her boyfriend and just have a little bit more independence. I think most 16 year olds would be happy with having a big house all to themselves. So now we move on to the night of September 22nd, 2006. And on this particular night, it was Friday and Cassie decided that she didn't want to be alone this night. So she ended up inviting her boyfriend over. So she invites Matt over and Matt arrived to the house at about 6 o'clock p.m. And not too long after that, 
two of their other friends showed up. These two friends were Brian Draper and Tori Adamkeck, and they also came over to the house. Now, everyone was the same age, and they all knew each other through high school. And when Adam and Brian arrived, Cassie decided to give them a tour of the house. It was a big, impressive house, and Cassie decided to give them the full-on tour, and so that is what she did. She brought them upstairs, downstairs, and the basement. After the house tour, the four of them then went back to the main level of the house, the first floor, to watch a movie. They ended up turning on Kill Bill Volume 2. Now, once the movie started, Tori and Brian decided that they didn't really want to watch this movie. It wasn't sparking their interest, and they kind of felt like they were fourth wheeling, third and fourth wheeling, onto Matt and Cassie's date. So they decided to leave, and they told Matt and Cassie that they were going to be going to the local movie theater to watch a different movie by themselves. And so they said goodbye to Matt and Cassie and went on their way. Now, what Cassie and Matt were unaware of at the time is during that house tour that Cassie initially gave them, Brian and Tori took it upon themselves to unlock the basement door without Cassie's knowledge. So after the boys left, Matt and Cassie continued on with their night. They were watching the movie, enjoying their time alone, up until the point where some very eerie things started happening in this house. Not too long after Brian and Tori left, the power in the house went completely out. And not only was this an uncommon thing, as it usually is, there was nothing that would have sparked this power outage. There was no storm. It wasn't windy outside. There wasn't any outside source that would have caused this power outage, which made it about 10 times more worrisome for both Matt and Cassie. Now, the power wasn't out for too long before it came back on, but once it came back on, it didn't stay on. Once the power came back on, the lights started flickering on and off, on and off. Now, obviously, at this point, Cassie and Matt were freaked out, and they weren't the only ones because Cassie's aunt and uncle, their dogs, their two dogs that I mentioned earlier, they were standing at the top of the basement growling and barking at something that was downstairs. However, Matt and Cassie never went to go check what was in the basement. They figured that it was just some weird thing. There wasn't any source or cause to it. And so they decided to just leave it alone. But it didn't stop there because then from the basement, they started hearing these loud noises, things being thrown, things being dropped. And understandably, again, it freaked out Matt and Cassie, but they did not go downstairs to the basement to check. Instead, Cassie asked Matt if she would be able to spend the night with him because she did not want to sleep at the house alone. And Matt ended up calling his mother and asked his mom if he could spend the night at Cassie's house or Cassie's aunt and uncle's house with her. However, his mother said no. And when his mom said no, she gave him an alternative option. She said, I don't want you spending the night there, but you and Cassie are more than welcome to come over to our house and she can spend the night here. Now, Cassie, being the person that she was, knew that she signed on to house sit for her aunt and uncle, knew that she had a responsibility, knew that she had to take care of their animals. So she decided after thinking about it for a little bit that she was going to let Matt go home and she would stay at the house by herself. So Matt's mom came and picked him up at around 11 p.m. that night and he said goodbye to Cassie and went on his way, not knowing that this would be the last time he would ever see her. Before we move on, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors for this video. Is your ex still using your Netflix account? Well, that is what one woman found out after she downloaded Truebill, which finds and cancels subscriptions with just a tap. Truebill is the new app that lets you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply just forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your account and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't 
have to. You guys, the unwanted subscriptions and canceling subscriptions is an ongoing issue in my family. Before we started using Truebill, we used to have monthly meetings about what subscriptions we had and what we needed to cancel because it's so hard to keep up with everything and companies make it near impossible to cancel. But Truebill has helped tremendously. My family saved $660 with using Truebill and we could not be happier. So don't fall for the subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash killer. Go right now, Truebill.com slash killer. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash killer. Now you guys, in the era of one of the most heinous serial killers of all time, one murderous crew went curiously unnoticed. The McCrary's committed countless abductions, murders, robberies, and created general mayhem everywhere they went. Families Who Kill, The Donut Shop Murders is a new true crime miniseries that follows a family who banded together to terrorize small town America, embarking on a brutal crime spree that captivated a nation. Led by the criminal duo of Sherman and his son-in-law, Carl, this disturbed family targeted people working night shifts in donut shops. In The Donut Shop Murders, you'll hear the details of their story for the first time from one of the McCrary's and the detective who tracked them across the country as they left death and destruction in their wake. Now, obviously, if you guys are listening here to me, you love a good true crime series, and this one will not disappoint you guys. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. I love the fact that they are so detail-oriented, and you get to hear from one of the McCrary's themselves. Follow Families Who Kill the Donut Shop Murders on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can binge all six episodes ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Comes to podcasts covering mystery and murder, Generation Y is a true original. If you're obsessed with crime and unsolved murder cases, this show has it all. Hosts Aaron and Justin cover cases from all angles. They break down theories, dive deep into forensic evidence, and discuss their opinions on the most perplexing cases. In a recent episode, Aaron and Justin look at the case of Lori DuPont. Lori was a well-respected 37-year-old nurse and a single mother. She met a physician named Mark Daniel at work and the two hit it off and began a secret relationship. But after a while, the romance cooled and Mark began harassing Lori at work. It turns out Mark had a history of dating and being abusive towards nurses. Lori filed for a restraining order, but before the judge could issue it, Mark entered the hospital with a military sword and committed an unthinkable crime. You guys, I am obsessed with the Generation Y podcast. I love how detail-oriented everything is, and each case that they cover really, truly leaves you on the edge of your seat the entire time. Clearly, if you're listening to me, then you also love a good true crime podcast, and I promise you this one will not disappoint. It's become my weekly routine to listen to Generation Y. I absolutely love them. And you can listen to the Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Okay, you guys, I want to talk to you about BetterHelp. I'm sure you have heard me talk about them before, but if you have not, BetterHelp is an online counseling service that provides you with professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will then be able to take an online survey. And based off of the results of that survey, BetterHelp will match you with the counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs. Once you're matched with your counselor, you'll be able to set up individual video and phone sessions with them. You'll be able to text them. They really will be available to you whenever you need them. And if at any point you want to switch the counselor that you were given, you will be able to do so free of charge. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, LGBTQ plus matters, grief, self-esteem, and more. Anything you share is confidential and BetterHelp is convenient, professional, and affordable. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, at betterhelp.com slash instinct. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash instinct. Now, the next day on the 23rd of September, Matt couldn't get a hold of Cassie. And not only could Matt not get a hold of Cassie, no one could get a hold 
of Cassie. He started to really worry and he didn't know why this was happening or what was going on. So he ended up calling Brian and Tori, the two boys that had been with them the night prior. And the two of them ended up picking up Matt and hanging out with him for the day just to try and get his mind off of things. And this didn't really help because the entire time Matt was still worried about Cassie and worried why she wasn't answering. So he was calling Cassie over and over again. However, he was not getting any response. Now, the following day, which was the 24th of September, no one had heard from Cassie still, and people were starting to get very, very concerned and worried, and no one had gone over to the house to check on her because this was the day that Cassie's aunt and uncle were actually scheduled to come home. So they figured that Cassie's aunt and uncle would just see her, send her off, and everything would be fine. However, when Cassie's aunt and uncle got home, they also had a 13-year-old daughter, which was Cassie's cousin. And so Cassie's 13-year-old cousin was with Cassie's aunt and uncle during the time that they were gone for the weekend. And once they all arrived back to the house, the 13-year-old cousin walked into the living room and that is when she discovered the lifeless body of Cassie lying on the floor after she was clearly brutally attacked. Now, immediately the police were called, and once police arrived, they were able to confirm that Cassie was in fact dead, and she sustained multiple injuries. It was determined that Cassie had been stabbed to death, and she had approximately 30 stab wounds all over her body. Now, after police were called, and after speaking to her boyfriend, Matt, they were kind of able to paint a picture for the night, and they were able to figure out that Matt Brian and Tori were the last known people to have seen Cassie the night of her death. And so because of that, they not only wanted to talk to Matt, but they also wanted to talk to Brian and Tori. Now, authorities were able to clear Matt pretty quickly. They were able to line up the alibi with his mom about him leaving. They were able to determine that at the time that Cassie died, Matt was actually not at the house anymore because he had been picked up. And they also gave him a polygraph test, which he passed. And so because of all of that, they then kind of switched their attention to Brian and Tori. Now, authorities brought Tori in the same day that her body was discovered to speak with authorities. And Tori had two separate interrogations with police one on September 24th and one on September 27th. Now, when talking to police, Tori told them that him and Brian had gone over to Cassie's house at around 8.30 because he heard there was a party at Cassie's house. However, nothing came from this party. So once they realized that this party was not happening, him and Brian decided to leave and go see a movie at the local movie theater instead. After seeing the movie, both of them then ended up at Tori's house where they spent the night. And that's what they Said their night consisted of. That was their night from start to finish. Now, when it comes to Brian's interrogation, he was also interrogated on the 27th of September as well as the 24th of September. And when he was interrogated, he basically said the same thing. He said that him and Tori arrived to Cassie's house a little bit after Matt did. He said he got a house tour from Cassie. He said that everyone was eating popsicles together. He said that they turned on a movie, but that him and Tori were not interested in the movie, so they left to go to the local movie theater. Now, Brian did add a little bit more detail than Tori did. He said that they went to go see the movie Pulse at the movie theater, which if you're unfamiliar, Pulse is a horror film. And so he said that him and Tori went to go see Pulse. And so based off of that fact, authorities, you know, kind of tried to get more details from him on that. They were asking him questions like where he parked in the parking lot. They asked who he bought the tickets from, how many people were in the movie theater, where they sat in the movie theater, and things things like that. And Brian wasn't really able to give too much detail. He said that he didn't really remember. He wasn't paying attention. And when it came to the movie Pulse in general, which is the movie that Brian said that him and Tori saw, he was asked what the movie was about. And Brian wasn't really able to give an answer. He told authorities that him and Tori had actually met these two girls in the movie theater. And when they met these two girls, Brian was just completely distracted. 
attracted. He said that he met this girl, her name was Heather, and that she was about 5'6", 5'7", with shoulder length brown hair. He said that he wasn't aware of where this girl went to school, he never got her phone number or anything like that, but Heather was the reason that he wasn't able to tell them what the movie was about because he never watched any of the movie once he started talking to her. Brian said that after the movie was over, him and Tori then went back to Tori's house and fell asleep there. Now, basically, automatically going into the interrogation, police knew a lot more than they let Brian know at first. They kind of wanted Brian to dig his own grave because they knew that Brian and Tori never went to the movie theater that night. And the reason they knew that is because they had talked to the people at the movie theater, they had looked at surveillance tapes, and Brian and Tori were nowhere near the movie theater that night. So investigators told Brian this, and when they did, Brian kind of had to act fast. And when you watch the interrogation footage, it's very clear that he quickly realizes that he needs to come up with something else. He quickly realizes that this story that he had stated where he was the innocent boy that just went to go watch a movie with his friend was no longer true. So he had to come up with something different. And this is when he tells police that he actually didn't go to the movie with Tori, but instead that him and Tori went to go rob cars in a nearby neighborhood. And he said the reason that he lied to police about it was because he heard each car that he went into, if he told police, was punishable with up to 10 years in prison. Brian said that Matt was also aware that they were going to be going and looking through cars and Matt even asked if he could join them at one point but then had to be picked up by his mom. Now when authorities then heard this story they asked Brian details. They wanted more details. What color were the cars? What kind of cars were they? What did you steal from the cars? But again Brian wasn't really able to tell them anything. He didn't remember what kind of cars they were. He said that he didn't steal any of the belongings that were in the cars. And he said that in total, they probably went through about four or five different cars. However, again, did not steal anything from them. Now, around this time in the interrogation is when Brian lets authorities in on another little secret. And this secret is that him and Tori were actually planning to make their own horror film. In the beginning of the interrogation, investigators asked Brian about his movie preferences. And he said that he was really into horror movies. His favorite movie of all time was Halloween. And he loved everything about horror movies, which comes into play a little later. Now, not only were Brian and Tori working on creating their own horror film, they also wanted Cassie to star in it. They wanted her to be the lead main character, and the plot of this movie was essentially a family who travels to a cabin, and the parents get murdered, and then 20 years later, they go back and revisit the cabin. That is what Brian said was the initial idea for the plot of this movie. They hadn't filmed it or anything like that, but that was their idea for what the plot was going to be about. But they did want Cassie to play the lead role. Now, Brian also admitted in his interrogation that he actually liked Cassie at one point. According to him, he liked Cassie way before Matt ever did, and Brian thought that him and Cassie had a lot more in common than her and Matt did. According to Brian, him and Cassie, neither one of them like drugs or like alcohol. They're not into the party scene. And according to Brian, Matt really was, so he didn't really understand why Cassie liked him so much because they seemed to have a lot of differences and morally didn't match up. And according to Brian, he said that he was actually planning on asking Cassie out. He was going to ask her out on a date. However, Matt got to her first. Now, after hearing all of this, after hearing the movie theater story and the car burglary story and Brian liking Cassie and the horror film and all of that, interrogators basically tell Brian that they know that the car burglary story is fake. 
And they started using the tactic of trying to pretend like they knew a lot more than they were letting on just to see what Brian would tell them to try and make it seem like they already knew what happened to Cassie. So Brian might as well just tell them because there's no use in lying anymore. Police asked Brian how he even thought Cassie died. And this was not news that was released into the public yet. And according to him, he said, quote unquote, I don't know, I guess she got stabbed or something, end quote. And if you weren't involved in someone's death, if you didn't know what happened to them, if you didn't know how they died, just throwing out that they were stabbed and that that was their cause of death seems a little bizarre. Now on the 27th of September, which was just five days after the murder, Brian folded and he ended up cracking and he told police everything. Brian said that him and Tori did leave Cassie's house after watching a little bit of the movie. However, they did not go to the movie theater and they did not go and rob cars. He said that they came back to Cassie's house shortly after and hid in the basement after leaving the door unlocked during the house tour. Now, after Brian and Tori had left the house, when Matt thought that they were at the movie theater, Matt actually called Tori and Tori told Matt that he had to be very quiet because he was at a movie theater and he couldn't talk very loud. However, what Matt didn't know, what Matt and Cassie didn't know, is the reason that they couldn't talk so loud wasn't because they were in a movie theater, but it was because they were hiding in the basement of Cassie's uncle and aunt's house. They were waiting downstairs in the basement and waiting for the perfect time to attack. They were using scare tactics, like I mentioned earlier, of turning the lights on and off and making loud noises, trying to lure them both downstairs. However, that did not work, and they were hiding down there for a good while. They ended up leaving Cassie's house at 8.45, and Matt ended up leaving Cassie's house at around 11. So they were definitely down there for at least a solid hour and they were down there controlling the electrical panel they were turning the lights on and off and they were the ones that shut the power off completely now once brian and tori knew that cassie was alone they tried to make more noises down in the basement by opening and closing doors in order to do what brian said which was just scare her however that's not what ended up happening brian said that the goal was to scare cassie enough to come downstairs into the basement however once they realized that Cassie had fallen asleep on the couch, they knew that they had to move upstairs. Both boys were armed at this time with different knives, and once they decided it was time to go, they both walked upstairs and hovered above Cassie, who was sleeping on the couch before stabbing her approximately 30 times, 12 of which were fatal stabs. Now, what makes this murder even more horrific and why it is referred to as the scream murders is because Brian and Tori dressed up as the killer in the movie Scream. Now, I've never seen the movie Scream. However, I don't think you have to see it to know what I'm talking about. It is the figure that is dressed in all black with that white mask that looks like someone screaming. So not only did Brian and Tori viciously and brutally murder Cassie, they did so dressed as the most infamous horror film character. Now, when Brian was telling authorities all about this, he heavily downplayed his role. He said that he thought, according to him, that him and Tori were simply going back to Cassie's house to scare Cassie and Matt. Nothing more. He said that he didn't think that this murder was going to happen. He had no idea. And he he said that Tori was the one that really initiated everything. At first, he even said that he never stabbed Cassie at all and that all of those 30 stab wounds came specifically from Tori himself and that he just kind of stood back and watched and was in disbelief because he was so scared because he didn't think that this was what was going to happen. Now, Brian ended up leading authorities to where all of the evidence was, and this was not too far away from Cassie's house, and they buried all of their props, and they attempted to burn everything. They tried to light everything on fire, including the masks, including the black clothes and the gloves, everything, but nothing actually successfully burned. Most of the evidence was still fully intact. Along with that, they also found the knives, which were the murder weapons, as well as a video 
camera that had confessions to the murder, which we will get to momentarily. Now, let's talk about Tori's interrogation on September 27th, because what Tori didn't know in this interrogation, we already went through all of Brian's, but what Tori didn't know in his interrogation was Brian had already given everything up. Brian had already told authorities what had happened or the majority of what had happened, but Tori didn't know that. So he's still trying to go in there and proclaim his innocence. He told police the same story about the car robbery, and he said that this was something that him and Brian had done before, once that year, and then once again in ninth grade. And like Brian, Tori also said that he didn't remember the types of cars because they went through a lot of them, so he wasn't able to verify any. Now, what's interesting here is that Tori's parents were also in the room at this point, and they were actually able to catch him in a lie. Tori's parents were sitting in on the interrogation when he was being questioned, and Tori told investigators that he stole a CD case from one of the cars that he went through with Brian that night. Now, not only do we know at this point that that's simply not true because now Brian has come forward with what had happened. When Brian was sticking to the car robbery story, he said that him and Tori didn't steal anything. And when Tori's parents heard about the CD case that Tori said that he stole that night, Tori's mom actually called him out on it and said that that CD case had been there far before this car robbery ever happened. So there was no way that he could have stole it that night because she had seen it for weeks prior to that. Now in the interrogation video, which I'm basically summing up at this point, Tori is physically shaken by this. He realizes that he's caught in some sort of lie and he needs to get himself out of it. So he just tries to push everything to the side and say, oh, that must have been from a different time and tries to move on with the rest of his story. Now authorities also, when looking into Brian and Tori, had asked their classmates what they thought about both boys. And while most people said that Brian seemed like a well-rounded, normal kid, people had very different things to say about Tori. They said that he would often act out by pretending to stab people at school. He would pretend to stab them or slit their throats. And it was also said that Tori had a crush on Cassie for two years prior to the murder. So not only now does Brian like Cassie, but Tori also was said to like Cassie too. Now, once hearing all of this, the investigators basically tell Tori that the gig is up and that they know he isn't telling the truth and that him and Brian are responsible. They said that they knew that Tori killed Cassie and that they have the evidence to prove it. And they also have Brian's confession. Now, this is when Tori's demeanor completely shifts and he realizes that he is caught. And the first thing he asks is, quote unquote, is everyone at school going to find out about this? Weird thing to be worried about, but who knows? Now, on September 27th, 2006, both Brian and Tori were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. On September 28th and 29th, Brian was interrogated again, and Brian said this time that Tori basically scared Brian into stabbing Cassie. So now Brian is admitting that he did stab Cassie, but it was at the hands of Tori, and Tori made him do it. Now, what we know is that Cassie's murder was 100% premeditated. This whole story that Brian is saying about how this was just supposed to be a scare tactic and a scare prank is 100% wrong. Because not only did they plan to kill Cassie, but on the night prior to Cassie's death on September 21st, Brian and Tori had actually planned on killing a different girl. However, she wasn't home that night, so they weren't able to do so. And you might be asking, how do we know this? How, how do we know that they planned on killing a different girl? How do we know that this is all premeditated. And that is because Brian and Tori were so gracious as to videotaping their conversations talking about them planning these murders. The video camera that was found dug up in the hole where all the evidence was that Brian took authorities to contained multiple confessions from Brian and Tori of them planning the murders and then the murders after they happened. 
They videotaped themselves prior to the murder of Cassie, and in regards to Matt and Cassie, Brian said, quote, There are friends, but we have to make sacrifices. I feel tonight is the night, and I feel really weird and stuff. I feel like I want to kill somebody, end quote. In that clip, Tori also says, quote, There should be no law against killing people. I know it's wrong, but if you restrict somebody from it, they're going to want it more end quote. Brian also says, quote, our first victim is going to be Cassie Stodart. She's going to be alone in a big dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? Now, the day of the murder, Brian and Tori discussed how they were going to kill Cassie and planned the whole night out on video at school. They videotaped themselves sitting there writing out how they were going to do this. And again, they said, quote, hopefully this will go smoothly and we can get our first kill done and keep going. I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she had to be the one. She's perfect. So she's going to die. Now, these boys even went to the extent of writing out a death list for who they were planning on murdering after Cassie. And not only did the boys take a video before the murder, they actually took a video after the murder as well, where in it, Brian says, quote, I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I stabbed her in the throat and saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I just killed Cassie. That felt like it wasn't even real. I mean, it went by so fast. And in it, you also hear Tori say in the background, shut the fuck up. We got to get our act straight. End quote. Now, both Brian and Tori were arrested on September 27th, 2006 and charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. They both went to trial separately, and during Brian's trial, the prosecution revealed that Brian stated that he was inspired by the shooters from the Columbine School Massacre. On April 17th, 2007, Brian was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Tori's trial started on May 31st, 2007, and just a couple days later, on June 8th, 2007, he was also found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. Now, in 2010, Cassie's family filed a civil lawsuit against the Idaho School District, claiming that the school was negligent and should have known that Brian and Tori were a threat to others. However, both the civil court and the state Supreme Court dismissed this case and said that the actions of Tori and Brian were not foreseeable, which is crazy to think because so much of their videotaped confessions prior to the murder were taking place at school in the library. They're sitting at desks and writing it all out. So I think you can kind of go either way on that one. But that, you guys, is the case of Cassie Joe Stodart. And to me, it's heartbreaking because I think of all of the scary movies that you watch growing up, all of the scary figures, all the scary characters, and you think they're either hiding under your bed or hiding in your closet and you, you know, sometimes sleep with the lights on, things like that. That is exactly what Cassie saw in her last moments of life. And to know it was by two people that were supposed to be her friends is even worse. All right, you guys, that is going to be all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday on YouTube. I will be back in a couple days with a brand new episode for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you tune in next week where we talk about the crazy case of Joe Cinque. He was murdered in Australia. It is a wild one. You guys are not going to want to miss it. And I hope to see you there.